A very good evening and thank you for joining us. We're coming to you from the Athena Hotel in Bugolobi. And tonight we'll be talking about cancers and blood diseases in children. We're taking it East Africa and today we have uh, a doctor from Tanzania, a doctor from Kenya and of course doctors from Uganda. So I'll very quickly introduce them and we can get started with our conversation. I'll start right next to me. We have Dr. Lulu Chirande who is from Tanzania. And right next to her is Dr. Joseph Lubega who is from Uganda. Next to him is Dr. Victoria Katasi Mwebe, who is from Uganda as well. And we'll go this side. We have uh, Dr. Robert Chimutai, who is from Kenya. And finally, Dr. Delgracious Manube, who is from Uganda. Thank you so much, all of you, for joining us. I must Thank say you. that they're all pediatrician, cancer, and blood disease specialists. Right? Yes. Correct. Absolutely. Okay. Let's say it as it is. <music> Well, once again, thank you for joining us. I'm very excited. It's very rare to have five doctors in one room giving me this much attention when it's I'm not, not sick. not a good sign. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not sick. But also we have uh, doctors from uh, different countries, so that's, that's really a good thing for our conversation. And we said we're talking about cancers and blood diseases in children. Maybe we could start by understanding them. When I hear this, I think leukemia. What else are we talking about? And I think, I think you're, you're thinking right in that... Um, Leukemia is the most common cancer in children, but when you look at the spectrum of cancers and blood diseases in children, they're quite uh, many. One, they're very different from adults. Mm -hmm. um, children tend to get blood cancers, leukemias, or cancers that arise from lymph nodes called lymphomas. They also tend to get uh, brain cancers, and muscle cancers, and kidney cancers. And I think between those, you're talking about up to 60% of all cancers in children. Okay. Um, but also, um, our specialty deals with blood diseases in children, which includes uh, sickle cell disease, which is a big, big problem all over Africa, hemophilia, and other blood diseases like bone marrow failure. What, what does hemophilia present as or look like? Okay, th these are children that present with uh, bleeding problems, so they can present as a, we see prolonged bleeding after injections or sometimes it's spontaneous when they fall down, so it's a bleeding disorder. Okay. But also to add, hemophilia mostly occurs in males, okay, so normally you will have this male who comes in and got a circumcision and got, was bleeding for two whole days or removed a tooth and bleed for another three days and required a blood transfusion. I mean, for a normal child, when you remove a tooth, you shouldn't get a blood transfusion. And the bleeding is deep, it's in the muscles. So they come with, you know, muscle swelling or swelling in the joints, in the knees, the elbows. And this starts, especially around times when they start to crawl, so they're able to apply pressure on those points. Okay. Are these cancers very common, though? All, all, all these conditions all together, they are really common. And just to give you a perspective, um, one of the reasons we are now paying out of attention to these problems is for a long time when you looked at Africa, people paid a lot of attention to children who died from malaria, from diarrhea, from pneumonia, typically infections. And the truth is those were the bulk of the problems of children in Africa and other poor countries. But over time, it, it's obvious that children are having sickle cell, children are having hemophilia, children have cancer and uh, they were not getting good care and it's uh, i think it's a natural evolution of our, our healthcare system that we pay attention to them uh, doing that requires a lot of specialized skills it requires uh, multiple team members to, to to play a role but th that's why we are paying a lot of attention to it now because these children do exist in our environment thousands of them or even tens of thousands how how serious is this for uganda for kenya for tanzania I think if I can add for, <coughs> for Kenya, uh, I think we really see a similar kind of a picture as we see in Uganda and I also guess uh, Tanzania. Uh, of course, of, of, of recent uh, people are noting uh, kind of what they consider alarming increase in, in the cases and uh, we're having better diagnosis. We are being able to, to, to more accurately tell these are cancers. And the other thing also we have to note is that other diseases like HIV, the, the deaths are coming down. So cancer is increasingly becoming more, uh, I mean, bigger in terms of contributing towards uh, deaths. So if we look at uh, numbers, really, we're kind of looking at uh, numbers, I think, which are similar in the region. And uh, having been in Uganda and seen this, I kind of really see a similar picture. 
So we're saying initially the cancer situation was overshadowed by... Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. As a matter of fact, if you go to Europe and the USA, uh, if you look at the three top causes of death, it's in children. Either children die as newborns because they're born, being born abnormal. Number two, for school age children, it's cancer. And number three, for teenagers and older children, it's accidents. And the reason for that kind of um, structure is because they took care of malaria, diarrhea, pneumonia, and other things. And what you see here in Uganda, in Africa, is as those things are taken care of and become less and less of a problem for children, is you see more cancer now emerging. It doesn't mean actually that cancer is increasing or sickle cell is increasing. Our understanding these diseases have been there. We just didn't pay attention to them because we are swamped taking care of kids, you know, who with malaria and HIV. And exactly. <laughs> yeah, and also you will find that if you look at the low and middle income countries where most of Africa is, they would give an estimate of about 300,000 children are born or have cancers. And if you look specifically in our society, over a year you would see close to about 500 and that's still a small proportion of the people in that just will, one hospital in, right mm. 500 in uganda in one hospital yes in a year. just 500 mm -hmm. in uganda in one hospital mm -hmm. correct yes. okay. and, 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 that, and that's cancer mm -hmm. sickle cell you're putting about mm -hmm. six thousand mm -hmm. in a year at molago hospital new patients with sickle cell that's a worrying number for Uganda. What of Tanzania? What's happening there? Yeah, also it's, it's similar. We have uh, quite a good number and I think what we also need to note that it's very important <coughs> us in this part of the world, the middle and low income countries to address childhood cancers and those blood disorders because that's where most of the world's children live. 80 to 90 percent of the children are in this part of the world. So we really have to address this problem. So even in Tanzania, I would give an example of Muimbili National Hospital where our biggest uh, uh, center where we treat childhood cancer is, we see around 400 new, and this we talk about new patients uh, yeah. presenting with cancer. And also we should note that uh, there is a selection. So this is just a small proportion of children with cancer because we quite a big number don't access the hospitals. So our capacity to diagnose, we say in the past we are overshadowed with malaria and the other diseases, but as well our capacity to diagnose them we are low. So quite a number died with cancer, maybe given a label of malaria, meningitis or other diseases. So in that's part of all this. And, and you know, uh, what Dr. Lulu says is a very important point we have to uh, emphasize. You know, in the, all of the United States, there are about 10,000 children diagnosed with cancer every year. 80% of those children are cured, meaning around 8,000 children are saved. Now, in Africa, if you're talking about hundreds of thousands of children, even if you save 20% of them, you've actually saved mm -hmm. more children than all the children in the mm -hmm. USA. So, so really what we are looking at, um, what we're doing now in Africa is trying to have these, however tiny in percentage US <coughs> increments will be in survival of these children, such a huge impact in terms of mm -hmm. uh, the number of children mm -hmm. that are saved. So what we're talking about is there's hope, right? Because <laughs> cancer. when you say cancer, you just think the end. Let's, th that's a life cut short the end even before you go for medication right from the start but you said something that reminded me I was somewhere and they said if they asked you to describe a Ugandan you would say it's a 15 year old girl because really that's the age bracket yeah. Yeah. most of us are children yeah. Yeah. okay not us yeah. clearly yeah. <laughs> but everybody else um, you're all part of a program and I think really that's the gist of our conversation today tell me about the program so, so the program we are part of is, is uh, the fellowship in uh, pediatric cancer and blood diseases at Makere University. It's a training program that um, is supported by Texas Children's Hospital and Baylor College of Medicine from the USA. And um, really the goal of it is to train specialists in children's cancers and blood diseases for East Africa and all of Africa really. And um, this came out of an understanding that whereas there are so many children who need this care, there were no specialists to provide the required care. And like all fields of medicine, um, you know, the key to moving the needle in this direction is really expertise. 
are not just expertise of the cancer specialists or doctors, but you're talking about surgeons, you're talking about radiologists, you're talking about uh, pathologists, people who are able to look in the microscope and determine which type of cancer a child has, you're talking about nurses and administration. And that's something in Uganda we always forget that out of the um, uh, inefficiencies in our systems are because of a lack of administrators who really understand the mission and, and the core of the operations they, are, they, are, they support. So, so it's, it's, it's really a, a mild country a program. Um, whereas so far we want to train people in Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania. We this year we are having actually trainees coming in from Malawi, uh, from Congo, from Nigeria. So it's really a beginning of addressing the problem of cancer and blood diseases in Africa. Well, again, for me, this all just spells hope. You say um, this part of Macquarie University, is this now part of the medical school? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's a new paradigm for the university because normally um, medical training, you know, in Uganda started, I think, in the 1950s or in East Africa. And people trained as general doctors back then. In the late 60s, uh, people started specializing for the level, you know, specialists in children, in adults, in women. And a lot of our training since then has been at that level. So what you're talking about now is taking people who are children specialists and then training them, in this case a two-year training program, in taking care of children specifically with cancer and blood diseases. All right, I'm, I'm going to get to you, Dr. Uh, Robert, but let's take a quick break and we'll start with you when we return. Welcome back. Thank you for staying with us. We are coming to you from the Athena Hotel in Bukolobi, and tonight we're talking about cancers and blood diseases in children. Uh, Dr. Robert, I cut you short. You wanted to say something. Okay, thank you, Josephine. I think what I wanted to, 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 to emphasize is really uh, Joseph's point about uh, paradigms uh, being shifted. And uh, we've noted that not only does improvement of cancer care within the hospital improve the care of children with cancer, but also is somehow what you almost have like a collateral effect to the uh, outcomes of the other children because uh, we, I mean the teams work as multidisciplinary teams and also that's another paradigm shift. I mean initially you just have one doctor looking at one patient but here you really must work in teams. So whether it's pathology, surgeons, intensive care, I mean all these other different uh, teams really have to work together. And, and you see this work in real time. I mean, it's, it's, it's not uh, artificial, you know, on, on a daily basis for every single child. You have a pediatrician, one of us talk to a surgeon, talk to a, a scan specialist, a pathologist. Then we have formal meetings where we all sit for the more complicated patients and we really go through this. And so to this point, you know, people have asked me, oh, well, why don't you open, you know, a clinic uh, to take care of children with cancer? And the answer is... I'm asking you now. You really... <laughs> it's probably not practicable, you know. Th this is not a specialty that one very good guy can sit in a, in a clinic and take good care of these children. You need to be in a place where you have all these specialists together. But well, we've seen hospitals abroad do it. I know that a lot of people leave Uganda and go to India, the USA, or wherever to get that kind of specialized services. What are they doing? I think the key around that is they may call it a clinic you're visiting, but it's almost like a medical center where you have a full range of specialists. And if they don't have them, they actually call them in to have a discussion on how your care is. And Joseph had mentioned that we do have tumor boards where we have a wide range of specialists who come in, and even then we don't agree on everything. But the whole idea is for you to sit down, have a discussion on how to care for this child so that you can get a good outcome. Okay. Yeah, and I think through that, actually outcomes, the patients do well. Uh, they do much better than if you actually go to an individual doctor and try to finish everything there. Okay, and maybe uh, what is so remarkable for me, particularly in our program, is we, we are very fast. I, uh, when I, I entered in pediatric cancers, cancers in children, I realized for a bigger part it's a part of time. And really here at, in our program, we are able to get a child in the morning and really move fast as a team and get 
figured what is the cause of this illness and sometimes started the child on treatment on the same day, which is really remarkable. I think we are beating some well-established <laughs> centers in the world. Take me through a day. <laughs> <laughs> so I come in with a child. What happens? Okay, so if you come in to Mulago with your child, and actually you have this as a nice system, we have our phone number, that because you might not direct fall into our ward, we have a person who is dealing with what we call consults. If you suspect, if we, you just think this child could have cancer, you call us. Then we will address the rest. We will figure out if the child is emergency. So we stabilize the patient. Can come with all these other difficulty breathing, whatever, we'll sort that out. Then we will think how do we really, because for cancer, we call it one disease, but they are different and they are treated differently. So it's very important to accurately figure out what exactly type of cancer is this, because the treatment could mean worlds apart. So we organize ourselves, we work as a team, get the specimen if we need to get a, if it's blood, some we diagnose from blood, some we need to get a tissue bag, so we get a small piece of the swelling. We look at the preliminary uh, investigations, we get the results. We also working like we say this is a real teamwork. We can we also do really a uh, very advanced test sometimes here within Uganda, which we call like for for blood cancer flow. We you look exactly at the type of the, the cancer. But as I'm saying, all these things, and then we get the pharmacist to prepare the chemotherapy when we have figured it out. And as I say, and if it's serious, we do it even at the middle of the night. Wow. So we if we, we believe it's important. So it so a few years ago. Um, three years ago, mm -hmm. so it typically took about two weeks mm -hmm. for a child with leukemia to get a, that diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Many of the children would be okay. dead by then. Now, the longest takes us is 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And that makes a big difference. That's 24 hours, like Dr. Lulu said, knowing exactly the type of leukemia cell this child has so that we can pick the exact treatment they need. So you're telling me that all of this is in Uganda? At Mulago. Yeah. Is there a plan to roll it out beyond Mulago? Well, um, before we get to that plan that you've asked, something else to add on the fact that this care is really multidisciplinary. We don't actually only work with teams here in Uganda. We also work with teams outside Uganda, like um, the Houston, Texas Children's Hospital. So we have what we call weekly tumor board. A weekly tum a tumor board is like a meeting or a discussion of that involves doctors. And these doctors can include the surgeons, the pediatricians, um, the radiologists, everybody who is involved in the care of a child with cancer. So we sit with also those from Houston as well, experts in a particular cancer sometimes. And if you're not able to figure out what it is right here at home at the base, somebody there is able to actually help you figure out what it is in real time. So that you're able to actually treat your children and give them optimum care. And so you're not guessing. Yeah, you know, you're it's, it's not guessing what they're doing there is what you're doing here. So. I mean, I'm amazed that this is happening here at home. Maybe to add, it's not only Texas. Our meeting are involved also with a team in Botswana who I have almost a similar center. We have a and team in Malawi. When I go back to Tanzania, I will be part of the team because the, the whole issue is really to have a harmonized, improved quality of care and outcome of children in East Africa. Then we throw out the Africa. Like you see now, we are going to have somebody from Nigeria. So, so the key to, to, to uh, rolling this out to other children, the children who don't show up in Mulago, even outside Uganda, is training. And that's why we're doing this. Is, is you train the specialists, they go to a center, and then they build a team around them. And then over time, of hopefully in the next 10 years, we'll have uh, really solid centers in each country, at least one in each country in, in Africa. So this started, when When did the program start? 2016, 2016. we started a training program we here in Uganda. We have in Barara already. Okay. Establishing a center in Barara, a product of this training program. Mm. What inspired you guys to join it? What made you decide to get into the program? Well, so personally, I am. Um, when I was a young doctor, when I had just completed medical school, that was about um, seven years ago, I joined the Uganda Cancer Institute because I was just. Um, I had this interest from medical school. You'd, you'd rotate there for just a week, and then you're faced with all these children on the ward with all these kinds of masses and swelling and bleeding, and you can't exactly figure out what to do for them, you know? And so I decided I wanted to go back there and figure out what exactly I can do for the children in that place. Did you have a particular child that ever came through and you saw them and said, this is why I really want to do what I'm doing? 
there's a particular child that comes to mind and I think I'll never forget that boy. So there was this morning, it was about eight o'clock and I'd walked onto the ward. Um, I had two of my colleagues that I used to work with on that day. And um, this mother comes running in with her child. She's so hysterical, she's crying. She's crying this 14 year old boy. Um, by the time she came in with a boy, he was totally swollen the whole face, the hands, you know, the chest, the neck. I had not seen anything like that before, so I wasn't exactly sure what to do. Um, so we put the child on the bed and start to try to assess what it is. The child was obviously very sick, so he needed oxygen. We put some oxygen, we tried to put some, you know, like catheters, and we called up the pediatrician at that point who was the head of the ward. And then the mom gives us the story of the fact that um, she hadn't come to hospital in about two months. But the reason she hadn't come to hospital is because three months previously the hospital had run out of drugs. So sometimes we would get drugs stock out. This boy had been diagnosed with leukemia and he had been on treatment for about a year. But for the past three months, the mom could not afford to buy the treatment because the hospital didn't, didn't have it. So she couldn't come in. And finally, what happened is that his disease grew and it started getting so bad that she couldn't keep him at home. So she had to bring him because he was at the point of almost dying, I must say. So that's why she walked in so hysterical and he was so sick. And at that point, what we really needed to do, you know, we figured that he must have like a, a we call them like a mass or something growing in his chest. That is what would cause him to have all this swelling because it's sitting on the, you know, on the vessels and sitting on the track here and he can't breathe. And at that point, what we needed is to probably wheel him into an ICU, like an intensive care unit. But we didn't have an intensive care unit for children in the hospital, you know. So that's something you couldn't give him. And without supporting him in that way, you couldn't save him, no matter what you did. So of course we knew that within the next two hours, we're going to lose him. We can do what we can, but without an ICU, we can save that boy. And in fact, within the next two hours, we had, we had lost that boy. So from there, I, I had the passion of, I need to train in pediatric oncology. Why? Because we need to build systems. We need to change what is here. We need to have a pediatric ICU. We need to be able to give the child radiotherapy at the moment that they actually need it. These children can survive. And if they survive elsewhere, why isn't it happening here? Really, we can do this. Do we now have a pediatric ICU? So we are in the process of actually building a fully fledged pediatric ICU. There is one that is partly it's a neonatal ICU in the children's hospital, in the new women's hospital. And that's where we take our children at the moment. But it's not to the point that we would want a real pediatric ICU to, to, to be, so it's, it's something that is in progress. Okay. Yeah. And, and I think uh, just <coughs> in, this really gives you a flavor of the challenges we are dealing with. It's, it's challenges of, one, you need the cancer specialists, that one thing, but then there's a system-wide system -wide issues. You need a health system, a medical system that can take care of very sick children, regardless whether they have cancer or not. And those are things that we are working on with the Malaga Hospital and Ministry of Health, you need a system where people understand teamwork and are able to work with each other. It's not a one-man show, you know. You need a system where, for example, one of our biggest challenge is getting blood products. Many kids on cancer treatment, obviously kids with blood diseases like sickle cell disease, they need blood, blood transfusion. And that's a big challenge in this country, getting you know, blood. So, so you need a surgeon. So there are so many components that have to come together for these children to survive. And most of the parents can't even afford this kind of treatment. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, I think um, just to mention a bit about the affordability, our program has really helped in reducing the need for payments. How is that? So we have, within the program, we're able to receive a child, do all the investigations without them actually needing to pay for, for any of the services, and they don't even need to pay for the specialists who are here. Again, how is that? This is as a result of the partnership we have with Texas Children and Baylor College of Medicine. So they're able to provide us with funds to make diagnosis, to help in treatment, and also to enable us to do our training locally here. Okay, and if I may add, uh, sorry, just to take, you, to take you back about the inspiration, uh, kind of really similar picture that we, we have with the, with the Vicky. Uh, and the reason myself as a Kenyan have come here and there are two other Kenyans here and another one is coming and to continue coming more and more is really I think the kind of training that we get here it's I mean in terms of the context the training the quality of the training and everything it really enables us to just go back and fit back into the system without really having to and like going to abroad for example where you go there and then come back home and start thinking of how do I adapt this and really to improve the patient's care so here, I think we, there's really a very hands-on system and approach and, yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and, and you will never, if you took people from Uganda abroad to train, one, you never train many enough, 
it will cost a lot of money. But most importantly, you never have the impact that uh, this program has mm -hmm. had. I, I can give you an example. Three years ago, uh, about 30% uh, of children with cancer um, on the Mulago Hill were alive or in treatment just after one month of getting a diagnosis. The rest are either dead or they've given up and moved on. Today you're talking about 85% of children being alive and in therapy, most of them will be in remissions. So it, 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 by training people right where the problem is, you, you really impact the patients in real time. And uh, again, you train even a broader team. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you would never have been able to airlift the nurse, the surgeon, and everyone mm -hmm. take them abroad to train. Mm -hmm. But now they all do it in real time in, in, in the solving the problems that they face in these countries, which are quite similar, like everyone has said. Okay. But also, okay. if you train people from here, you help to actually, you're able to adapt solutions to the actual yeah. problems that you have on ground. Yeah. I mean, if I trained in Europe, I'm not going to be able to be faced with the same situation of my patient has no transport to come to hospital, because this is something I see every day. I have to keep calling my patients, want you here, what can we do? I don't have the problem of my patient has nowhere to stay. So here we have to get hostels to actually accommodate patients who have been treatment for like two or three years. You know, I won't have the problem of malnutrition as much as it is. My mom can't, the, the mother can't afford food for the child. You know, so, so really it's as hands on as he said that it is. Oh, I, I want to hear your story and his, but after this break that we're going to take just now. Welcome back, thank you for staying with us. We are coming to you from the Athena Hotel in Bugolobi and it's amazing what's happening in Uganda in the medical field. I'm, I'm really amazed listening to the things that you're all telling me. I, you're doctors, so I have no choice to, but to believe you. So I'm going to believe that they are true things and that we are doing really well. Dr. Lulu, what inspired you to get into this training, this program? Okay, okay. so maybe two stages why I came to train in Uganda and why uh, pediatric hematology or blood cancers and blood disease in children. Uh, so my, my, when I finished the internship, that when I became a, just a doctor, I was an empty free to do anything. But somehow I started working in a children cancer ward and really uh, I got really attached to the children, the parents, you know, these are, are different. We, we really build a relationship with our patients because we see them for a long time, sometimes three years and you get to know the stories of the parents, the families, and everything. And the fact that I realized this patient can be cured, and by then we are curing very minimal percent. Most of them died. So I, I, I got like a calling that I have to do something. And I realized really that we didn't have trained people in Tanzania. Uh, then you have to be a pediatrician, that I was a general doctor. So the road would be, I have to go for three years training pediatrics, then do two more years training in uh, specialized in cancer and blood disorders in children. So I decided to take this route. I did my pediatrics at Mwimbili as a preparation to do the cancer and the blood part. But then after I finished, I had to look for a training. There was no training close to home. There was no this training in Tanzania for this specialization. There was no in East Africa. So they come, the closest was South Africa and there was a long queue I applied. They said, very good, you seem exciting, you, we would like to train you, but we are taking like two candidates, so I was on a waiting list. Um, and like a year later, I got a call from South Africa, they connected me from a training in Canada. Also going to Canada it takes a long other things, we have to do exams, it means me leaving home. I was a mother already, a wife, it was almost impossible. And it, this was like 2014, actually 2013. So then I, I continued with my life in Tanzania, waiting maybe to hear from South Africa, and I was already wondering, ah, maybe I should do something else, until this program started in Uganda. So when it started in Uganda, it was really a good opportunity, close to home, but also the environment, as we said, I, I felt that I'll be trained in the things that I, I see. When I go back home, I want to be stranded. How do I apply the knowledge and the things I had there to, to my local environment. So then I, I took the opportunity. And really when I come, uh, the program is awesome. <laughs> okay. uh, and, and this is a common theme. Uh, almost every trainee that has joined this program <coughs> is a pediatrician who in one way or form has been involved in care of children with cancer, sickle cell, or other blood diseases. 
they're often the leaders of this field in their countries, but they never had a chance to get formal training. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dr. Delgracious. Well, my story is long, but I'll try and summarize it in two parts. Tissue? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. No. Um, so, my inspiration was really from the children on the ward. I've primarily worked after my pediatric training in Molago Hospital. And we, in the past, would actually just identify children who would have cancers and then refer them up to the Cancer Institute. And I have this child who I, I remember so well because as a training program within the university and in Molago, would have what we call grand rounds. So you'd have undergraduates, postgraduates come and we presented this five-year-old child who we thought had tuberculosis of the spine. So came in with a fever, weight loss, he had a mass around the neck, a mass within the, the chest, and he wasn't able to walk. And then we found a big swelling on the back of his, his spine. So we did a test which just looked primarily at what we call a picture of what the tissue looked like, and the diagnosis was tuberculosis. So we presented the child, we said we have the right diagnosis, everyone said yes, good, correct. One year later, I go up to the Cancer Institute to see a friend of mine, and then I see the mother. And the mother is like, Musao, Musao, I was like, what's wrong? My child is here. And I'm like, well, this is not the TB ward. The TB ward is ward <laughs> five and six. You're in the Cancer Institute. She says, yes, my child actually has cancer. So when I reflected, and thought about how do we make this diagnosis. It was just the systems that we have, the expertise on how do you diagnose cancer. What additional things could we have done differently? And now in the program, when I think of what I could have done differently then, was just escalate the next step in terms of the diagnostic capability by doing additional tests that would have excluded TB, and this child would have been treated one year earlier. So that really made me think about, um, sorry, that, that really made me think about what can you do. You had a chance to see a child who you could have healed then and has gone through a complication. He, this child couldn't walk because now the whole of the spine had been eaten up by the cancer. Do you know where he is now? Um, the last time I checked, he was in a wheelchair doing well. He had a lymphoma, which they treated at that time, but the complication of the limbs never went away. Okay. But when you're talking about all of this, when children don't really like going to hospital. Well, they don't like you people with white coats, because you prick them, you do all of those things. Does treatment involve anything else besides administering drugs, social aspects, smiling and yeah, yeah. being yes. nice to them? and? So our children actually will live with them, as I said, so they can stay in hospital for uh, three months up to a year up more, and we realize all these needs, not only of the children, even of the parents. So we, we provide for them all these uh, play therapies. We have many people, so care of children with cancer really has to involve many people, even beyond the hospitals, the community as well. Like she talked about the hostels, we have people who are helping us by running hostels and managing them where we send our patients there. So we have programs of like training them, giving them activity painting, like now we have very really beautiful painting at our hospital, people come, we have different things, we train them, they paint. Where I'm coming from at Muimbiri, also we have a parent program, because as we talk, they don't have money. So we help them, they uh, make some things, add things, they can make and they can sell, they have gardens in their hostel, they grow some vegetables. So we, we, we need all these things to, we usually have this annual camp, survivors camp as well, that is to give children uh, a quality time to intermingle with others, but it us as well to see the work we are doing because it motivates us, it keeps us going. It's somehow an emotional field, so we need all these things. So maybe others can add, but we have different components of trying to give the life. We, we say our children can have cancer, but we don't want them to lose their childhood. So we try to, we have TVs where they can watch some cartoons. We, we, we try as much as possible. You know, most children with cancer and therapy and we're between three months, that's a minimum, but some up to three years. And often they will be coming to the hospital every few weeks, a minimum every month. Mm -hmm. So you have to create an environment where the ambience is more of a home than yeah. a hospital. And that's true to how we interact with the children, but also how we interact with the parents. 
but also how we interact with each other because it's a field that uh, very, can be very stressful. And so people need to support each other and that's why you need this spirit of uh, um, uh, you know, people who understand working with teams and making sure they minimize the stress that uh, everyone has to go through doing this job. Yeah, and I think also, um, although Joseph may not have said it, he just tried to keep it in, but we do have our crying moments. <laughs> so you will find that you have this child who you thought, yes, I'm going to treat for cancer and we're going to cure. But when you do all the tests that are, <laughs> when, when you do all the tests that are done, you realize that you may treat the child, but just to prolong how long they can stay. And breaking that information to a parent is really tough. I've always wondered how the doctors then do it. Where is your emotional support? How do you, because you can't keep taking in all, soaking in all the pain, eventually you, what's your outlet? Oh, we've booked a pub in town. <laughs> every, every day we go and drink. <laughs> and um, we, have, we have happy no, hours honestly, once so a month. I think it depends so, yeah. on the person, first of all. Um, <laughs> so we all have different hobbies. And we all engage in them. Um, Robert likes watching motorcycles, so he goes for those <laughs> things. Um, you know, motorbikes, yes. Um, you know, people do different things. So some, I know part of the team, some people like going to the gym, like Lulu, I also like going to the gym. So you don't go to the pub with the... the, the the pub is not true for every day, but we have what we call happy. <laughs> we call, that is what we call happy hour. So we normally, like once a month, meet and do something fun as the team, just to let down, eat, be happy, relax outside the hospital. So we choose wherever we want to go. And and, and in addition, we, we 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 acknowledge and recognize that we are dealing really with the uh, stressful emotion, and we let everybody. We say that if you feel th there is a time you just feel I can't, so you have to be open. I think it, that I need to sit somewhere and just let myself. We cry. It's, yeah, yeah. It's it's okay to cry. So you cry it out, yeah. and then we support each other. I think we we, we are more than for me like uh, we are more than w colleagues working. We are like a big family that support each other. And our our patients, I think, among the things they get from us, maybe it's most important. We just love them and we care for them. And this they know. And because they know this, if they I stick can, around. Sometimes they stick around for us. It's amazing. We also have the, uh, the, the, the moments when, I mean, after treating a child, you really feel, and you've cured them, you really feel, you know, you, you, that just feels so good, yeah? yeah. And uh, we have a bell <coughs> that we ring, oh. and yeah. And, and the red carpet. And a red carpet uh -huh. uh, ceremony. And we, we, I mean, pediatric cancer, I think the good thing is, majority of children are curable. For the yeah. blood cancers, a lot of them, it's a lifelong disease. So I think your joy is always seeing the children smiling, being told by the parents they went to school today, they've had very few episodes, mm -hmm. just seeing their cards, the things are just improving, you know. I mean, it's, it's one of the best feelings. So we have five minutes. Let me start with you, Dr. Robert, and then we'll come like this. Yeah, I think, uh, thank you so much, Josephine. I think this has really been a very good opportunity. Uh, just come out from the hospital and be able to see what we do. Uh, the field of pediatric uh, hematology, I mean, and cancers, uh, is a field which is really growing rapidly. We are the, the West is I mean ahead of us, but we are going to catch up with them if we put all these efforts together. And I think we need to think not only just uh, Uganda, the regionally, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, so that we do the same things because because there is not a lot of magic. We just need to follow. I mean, to work as a team follow protocols, follow, I mean, follow the paradigms which actually have improved outcomes in the West. I think it's really just working together yeah, and doing research. Yeah. First, I would like uh, everybody who is watching to know that really majority of children with cancer can be cured. Uh, among the things that are important to change, we need to get these children early so, uh, and treat them at the right moment, get the right diagnosis. And uh, this program is just starting to do that. And also I would like us all the time to know that children in cancer are in our region because most of the children are there. So we can make a, even a bigger impact that HIV programs have done. Okay. And among the three of you, as you're wrapping up, I'm coming to you next, Dr. DeGracious. If somebody could tell um, the parents out there what to look out for, you know, with their child, little signs and symptoms, so we can catch it early, like you said. Um, I think one thing is that for you to know that your child has a cancer or a blood disorder, it's really tough because 
unless it's one of those congenital diseases that you're born with, cancer can occur spontaneously without you even knowing. But generally, you would find a child who is well playing, gets a bit tired, gets a little bit pale, you're used to seeing a bit red hand, now it's a bit lighter, a swelling that is growing quite rapidly on any part of the body, a change in their behavior is really something that, and even a fever, these types of fevers where they treat for malaria every other week, it really gives you a, a, a sign for you to ask for extra help. But as we wrap up, I'd like to thank you for hosting us on the program. I mean, education for the community and the country as a whole and a region would really help us to know that we have a service that is available within the country and a very dedicated team of pediatric hematology oncologists. Okay. Dr. Victoria? Yeah, so thank you, Josephine, for having us on this program. I guess what I want to tell everybody out there is the fact that this problem of cancer and blood disorders is for us all. We need to work together in the communities. The fact that when you see this child who has something that is suspicious, you come to hospital, but also that we support the training for the doctors, not just in Uganda, but worldwide, especially in the sub-Saharan Africa. Because together, if we build the team, we are able to actually strengthen the care in our continent as well. And also just for everybody to know and to think about the fact that every child matters. It can't be that we decide, you know, it's just a small problem. HIV is bigger. Every child is important. Every child has a dream and they want to be something in life. It's up to us to help make that dream come true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so so um, I think one of the key things that to me is very important and this team has got and is spreading is the fact that no matter what, you have to care about patients. And um, it's true that caring hurts, but the fact that caring hurts doesn't mean you stop caring. Right. So and and like everyone has said, if there's anything we give our patients, uh, you know, yes, we give them chemo, we do lab studies and so on and so forth, but we care about them, and I think that's very important. Um, two is is that um, you know we are curing kids with cancer. It can be done. We know how to do it. Yes, we could cure more if we had everything we need, but we are slowly getting there. I always equate this to you know. Um, the pits in the F1 Grand Prix, you know. Um, you know, if you ever watch the F1 Grand Prix in the pit, people are able to change a car tire within 10 seconds. And the way they do it is because you have a team of a dozen people, everyone knows exactly what they're supposed to do, and they do it so well, but they do it in a way that's coordinated with the others. If that fails, if one person fails, then, you know, it's, it's probably tens or millions of dollars that are gone, you know. So, and that's how we look at cancer care. You need people who know exactly what you are doing. You need people who are willing to work with others. And, um, and they do it with that level of precision. And if you do that, you cure these children. And that's what this program is doing. And hopefully this will spread to other countries and we keep doing it until we reach the last child. Wow. Well, if there's a doctor that's been watching and they're thinking, how do I get into this kind of program? Or what if, how, what, what's, what's the process? What's the procedure? So. Um, First, you need to have the interest, okay? Um, and then, because it's a pediatric program, you need to have specialized as a pediatrician to do the super specialist. Every year, we send out an advert um, for people who are interested in this program, and then we hold interviews. So, if you are eligible and you come for the interview and you make it through the interview process, then you can get onto the program. And the reason is because the numbers may be too many. Like this year, I think we had uh, up to about 40 applicants, but we can't take everybody. That's why we need to interview and screen. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Well, thank you all so much for coming to the show and for sharing these experiences. I'm amazed about what's happening in Uganda, and I'm glad that we can carry the resources across. We really are an East African community. Thank you once again, and well, that brings us to the end of our show for tonight. Coming up is NTV Weekend Edition.